Okay, hello everybody and um, and welcome. Thank you for your participation, uh, taking time out of your day to join us. Um, I'm excited that you're here and uh, very excited to talk about a pretty interesting topic, which is how to market yourself. Um, this is part of a series for uh, and from Worth Media Group. My name is Paul Stimoulis. I serve as the president. And um, we have a set of activities around the leading advisor community. Um, and we'll be sharing a little bit more about what that is later on in the session. But for today, um, the, the topic and conversation is around uh, marketing and personal brand. And for that, we are very excited to have uh, two wonderful guests joining us, uh, first of which is Maisie Anderson Davis. Good afternoon, Maisie. Thanks for joining us here today. Uh, Maisie is a, a senior practitioner with the Penta Group. Um, that's a strategic communications firm based in New York. And Maisie has an amazing background in so many industries, health, public affairs, politics, social policy, but, um, but in particular practice around financial firms and communication and PR and strategic communications uh, toward that vertical. So a wonderful subject matter expert. And Maisie, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. Thanks for having me, Paul. Um, shall I do a quick intro of myself now? Or... Please. I was hoping you'd just yeah. say a little bit about yourself. and then we'll I'm happy to. Thank you, Paul. It's a delight to be here. Thank you for having me on this panel uh, this afternoon. So as Paul said, um, I've had a fairly diverse career, mainly based in the UK. You can tell from my accent, I expect that I'm British. Um, my career has spanned public affairs, public policy and communications. Um, I guess most salient to our conversation today, I spent three years um, in the public affairs and corporate communications function at Nomura at their EMEA headquarters in London. Um, and I also spent four years myself as an elected politician in the UK, um, which I think has given me a kind of a unique spotlight, perhaps, on what it feels like to be um, kind of uh, in the in the public uh, domain and, and have that spotlight on me as a politician. Um, I moved over here to the US uh, in 2019 to do a master's at Princeton University and then found my way here to New York, where I'm a director um, in the strategy team at the Penta Group. So Penta, um, we're a stakeholder solutions firm. Uh, we have two uh, sides to what we do. There's an intelligence um, practice that do work such as reputational analysis, trend forecasting, public opinion polling, and, and things like that. And then we have a strategy department, which is where I sit in New York. Um, we have a wide range of clients, many of whom are in the financial sector, um, and, and I work across a number of financial and insurance clients and we advise on anything from uh, wider communication strategy issue and reputation management and um, brand management um, media relations crisis council so the kind of full gamut of uh, of communication support um, I hope that gives you a good uh, background on me and I'll have back to Paul now. Sure does. And it's a brain we're going to pick uh, for the next uh, 45 minutes. And then uh, likewise, we need some expertise and guidance on uh, this particular industry, um, uh, advisory, professional advisory, financial firms. And for that, we turn to Derek Bruton. Uh, Derek is an industry veteran and senior managing director with Gladstone Financial Group. Um, and Derek has a bunch of responsibilities supporting M&A. Uh, there's, there's a search practice in there as well at, at Gladstone, but also, uh, frankly, leading the company's charge on strategic growth uh, initiatives and the growth division. So, Derek, um, a little bit of background, if you could, on, on, on you and more on, if you can, Gladstone Financial. Well, Paul, thank you for, uh, for allowing me to join today. It's a pleasure. And it's a tough Maisie's got a tough uh, a background to follow. I, I got to tell you, first of all, I've I've got just a Gilroy, California accent, so nothing <laughs> special there. Uh, but uh, well, what a wonderful background, Maisie. Uh, so I've been um, in the industry, in the wealth management, financial services industry for over three decades. And as Paul said, I now with Gladstone Group, which is primarily three businesses, an M&A uh, advisory firm, investment banking, uh, another way to say that, a strategic consulting firm, and also a executive search firm. And we often say, you know, we start out in executive search, we put good people with, with great companies, and now we put great companies with great companies uh, on the M&A side. And so uh, leveraging my background in working with RIAs, financial advisors, and institutions that serve that group uh, for, for the last 30 years, 
Um, I've gotten to know quite a few firms out there that are really doing it well in this particular topic from a marketing and branding standpoint. Many that haven't done it so well, some that have capitulated basically and said, you know, maybe it's time to look at other options, including joining firms that are doing are, are successful in marketing and, and branding themselves. Um, so I've gotten to learn quite a bit from these firms, but mostly what I've spent my firm or excuse me, spent my career on is helping firms grow their businesses um, and, and, and sometimes look at different verticals to, to grow in. So uh, again, it's a pleasure to be joining this, this uh, call today and, um, and talking about this topic. Thanks, Derek. Um, and, and it's a great perspective because you are in the growth advisory business, whether that's inorganic through M&A or through your strategic consulting. But um, people focus a lot on the different areas of growth. One I think they may or may not focus on enough is marketing and frankly, the brand. Um, and whether that's a personal brand for an independent um, RIA, for example, or a firm-wide brand, um, which is where we have so much to get into. So Maisie, maybe the first question over to you, you know, help the audience understand what is um what does it mean uh tell us a bit about a, a brand and in particular a personal brand and how should folks even begin to think about uh do i have a personal brand and the brand that i have give us an overview of, of just that to start with please sure happy to paul and i think that um for, for many people, the idea of a personal brand seems almost a bit strange and a bit sort of an alien concept in a way. When we think brand, you know, it's totally natural to think consumer brands. You know, that's what springs to mind. Apple, Amazon, Coca-Cola, like the biggest brands in the world. And, and then when you think about applying that to yourself, it can seem very, very odd. Um, so perhaps a good place to start is really to define what a brand is at its most basic level. So a brand is really something that distinguishes one seller's goods or service from another seller's goods or service at a, at a most basic level. But a brand can be so much more than just a brand name or, or a symbol. Um, and it certainly is something that you can apply to yourself and develop yourself. So a personal brand um, is really the intentional image of yourself that you want to project of yourself, of your skills, of your career. How, how you want that to be projected to the wider world, what you have to offer, and also what drives you, what drives you in your career, what gets you up in the morning, what's your what's your personal style as, as a business leader, and what experiences that you've had through your career and your life do you really want to actively project to the world? Um, and certainly here at Penta, our view is that as a business owner or, or an executive of some sort, thinking about your personal brand is absolutely vital. You, it should be something that is thought through carefully by you and that is crafted to be authentic to you. Because really only if you can achieve some consistency um, it, it, and, and, and kind of a depth of thought and strategy behind it, will it resonate with the people that you need it to resonate with? So that's your clients, your colleagues, your wider network. Um, and I thought at this point, it might be helpful to reflect on a related, but not exactly the same concept, which is that of reputation. Um, so they are similar brand and reputation, but they're not the same. So a strong brand, for example, doesn't always equate to a good reputation. You can probably think of some examples of consumer brands um, that have a very strong and well-known brand, but because of certain set of circumstances or a situation, uh, develop a bad reputation. Um, and when it comes to your personal brand and your personal reputation, it's important that you think about both of those elements. So as opposed to your brand, which you project out to the world, your reputation is what a wide range of stakeholders think of you. Um, so that could be your current clients, employees, suppliers, the media, anyone really, the general public. It depends what, what your career path has been. Um, and when it comes to your reputation, 
Um, that's something that you can evolve and it's a longer process. So you can't sort of re-reputation in a way that you could potentially rebrand. So it's something that takes more time and more thought. Um, it's something that you you kind of need to employ a more subtle approach to. Um, but, you know, our view is uh, whether you're thinking about yourself as a personal uh, business owner or an individual or your business, it's very important to spend some time carefully thinking through both your brand and your reputation. And, and it's super fascinating what you said about reputation versus brand. Um, you know, uh, you know, we're in a community here that people just uh, bestow uh, expertise and advice. Um, they do the work, the work creates their reputation. And oh, by the way, you know, there's a shingle behind it. And, and um, you know, that becomes essentially the brand for what we just described. What you're suggesting is maybe there's a way to think about that on a bifurcated basis. And maybe we'll get into the second part of that uh, a bit more. Um, but Derek, over to you, maybe before we kind of talk about uh, marketing branding as it relates to um, companies specifically, give us an overview of what's the backdrop taking place right now in M&A in the landscape? What's happening? Are, are people more inclined to sell, less inclined to sell? Is there more activity where people are thinking about uh, inorganic growth versus, versus organic growth? Just a sort of state of play on, on what you see from your chair. Yeah, well, what we're seeing right now is there's a lot of consolidation in our industry, and it's being driven by a couple of uh, key trends or key characteristics in our industry right now. And and I'll just name a couple of one is just the demographics of of our business uh, in the wealth manager space. The average owner of a wealth management firm is 60 years old, so that's the average. That's the mean. So there are many uh, owners out there that are much older than 60 in your 70s and 80s that are running businesses today. <clears throat> and they may be looking to retire. They may be looking to pass their business on to the next generation of advisors um, within their firm, whatever it is. But demographics is a catalyst right now to a lot of the consolidation that we're seeing in the business. Another big trend is this movement towards holistic wealth management and firms wanting to go beyond, transcend just the asset management of, 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 of capabilities and, and their expertise and get into financial planning, estate planning, tax planning, insurance planning, because many of many clients today are looking for that kind of one-stop shop experience where I can go in and my advisor, either he or she will understand all of these different topics and how they fit together in a total wealth management experience. And so that's driving firms to up their game in, in the areas that they're not a particular expert in. Either that's upping their game through hiring people, through spending more money sure. and using technology in different areas, or perhaps... It may be that they don't have the inclination to get into these areas. They don't have the money to get into those areas. They don't have the expertise. And so maybe we hitch our wagon to a bigger player out there in the industry that has built that platform uh, that they can plug right into. So age demographics and uh, that holistic wealth management trend is, is really serving as a as major catalyst towards a lot of consolidation in our industry right now. And let's get to the topic of branding and marketing. That's another thing. A lot of firms, you know, realize that they feel like while they feel like they have a very good brand, oftentimes that brand is their name on the door, right? Especially small business owners. Um, they realize that uh, that brand may not uh, be you know, may not have the reputation outside of their general geographic area. Um, they, it may not even be a very strong brand to begin with, because as Maisie pointed out, one of the things that brand is built on is, is something that distinguishes you from somebody else. So maybe they've got something, but they haven't really defined that. And, and you can't see it in a website. You can't see it in materials. You can't hear it when you're talking to them. And so some firms have looked at consult have looked at selling their businesses either part of it or all of it to go after to be associated with a bigger brand and a bigger uh, maybe a, an experience that could might distinguish them from other people in their community so 
long answer to your short question, but uh, that's sort of what I'm seeing out there in this marketplace right now. No, I, I, it's a great answer to the question, and I think a lot more is happening. So if you just look at the trends, you have an older demographic. It's It, it may or may not be causing um, how people are thinking about uh, their growth stage and what then becomes. If that's inorganic, it sounds like there's more consolidation. Bigger seems to be better. Um, but that's important because... Um, Maisie, just taking what Derek said, I, I think it's fascinating. So I sit here, for example, uh, and I now, you've caused me to now think about my brand. I have my reputation, my work, my practice, my small firm. Um, you come in and we are now sitting in front of you as a, as a new client. Tell us where do I begin and what would you do in looking at us uh, as your client? And, and tell us and take us through what now happens. How do I, how do I think about this? Yeah, of course. Happy to, Paul. I think um, the first thing you should always do is take a big step back. And I mentioned earlier, but um, as an individual or, or, or as a small business owner, thinking about uh, what motivates you. Why did you get into this career in the first place? And, and also, what are your values? What are your beliefs? And what are your goals for yourself and for your business? So the brand is that core and that foundational. I think if it's going to be an effective brand, app, app brand absolutely sure. has to be, because as I said earlier, it has to be authentic to you, because if it's not authentic, it, it will not work, it will not resonate, um, you won't be able to consistently apply it in the way that you talk, and, and it'll, it'll start to come apart at the seams. So yeah, it's absolutely as core as that. Um, one thing you can do um, at, the, at that very early stage is maybe even just think of some words that might best define you. Just, just a set of, a, of, of simple words that define you and your approach to what you do. So, you know, that could be, for example, something like entrepreneurial or dedicated or thoughtful or bold. Um, or perhaps you want to, you know, to your point, Derek, about those people that have been in industry for a while is, is talk about yourself as an industry veteran that can, in certain cases, really resonate and be exactly what people are looking for. Um, so that would be step one. Um, and step two in that real like early stage thinking through the issues is thinking about who your stakeholders are. So who are those people in, in the world, but particularly in your existing network or networks close to your network, who will be able to help you and your business succeed and thrive? So you really need to quite systematically map that out. And, and, um, and those are the people to whom your brand needs to be projected and with whom you need to have that solid, really positive reputation. And then the next stage would be to come up with your plan and build a suite of materials. Of course, at this point, um, as you mentioned, Derek, there are, there are some, some businesses that are able to uh, devote a significant amount of time and financial resources to this process and others that will be doing this single-handedly, just doing it themselves. And if you are in that category, there are absolutely things you can do yourself. Um, but starting with those two very kind of core steps of thinking through really who you are will allow you to start to craft a way of talking about yourself and your business that will differentiate you from others. Um, another sort of appended step that you could add there is a, is a broader competitive review. So who are your competitors, both within the independent uh, financial advice community, but also look at those institutions that you may be competing for clients with and have a think about where you can differentiate yourself about uh, against those the, that competitive landscape so that you can come up with that authentic, natural language that truly describes what you do and what you offer to clients, but that also sets you aside from, from that broader landscape of, of people offering similar services to you. That's fascinating. Um, uh, Derek, I, I'm, I'm curious. Um, you come across, like you said, a, a subset of everything. Those large firms that that focus a ton on brand reputation and the work they're doing. Um, and then all the way down to, let's say, the individual IRIA and smaller businesses that may be sort of an aqua hire type opportunity into something larger when that when that situation comes up. Um, do you look at brand as a as a variable in in valuation in in multiples? I mean, do you look beyond the human beings that sit inside a firm and, and separately look at the brand in your either due diligence or in, in thinking about, you know, where the value exists in a particular firm? Absolutely. I mean, brand is um, <laughs> brand too many buyers. If one has a strong brand, 
it, it can often translate into organic growth. And organic growth, the ability for a firm to grow organically, not through acquisitions or recruiting, but just bringing on new clients, the ability for firms to do that is held at a premium these days. And, and then if somebody is growing, the buyer is going to want to know, well, what are you doing to, to grow organically that a lot of other firms aren't? And does that have something to do with your brand, your reputation, the consistency of your offering, how you differentiate yourself? I mean, I, I, when I think about the advisor businesses that I see out there, I can't help but think about, you know, a little tangent here. One of my favorite little restaurants in San Diego, it's actually a, a Japanese place. And it goes to show that location isn't everything about restaurants because this place is in kind of a not so good neighborhood tucked in a strip mall and it's located between a 7-Eleven and a Planned Parenthood office. So it's defying all logic as it relates to location, location, location. But when you enter this place, you're greeted with a, you know, a welcome in Japanese from all the sushi chefs or sitting in the middle of the restaurant surrounded by really cool decor. So before you even pick up your chopsticks, you're already starting to dig this experience. You feel that it's different than other places. You've completely forgot that you can buy a 32 ounce big gulp next door. The food and the quality is amazing, but it feels like it's, it's just part of the overall experience that's making this impression on you, this lasting impression, and this impression that you wanna go tell other people about. Um, the cost of the experience, by the way, is quite high. It's ridiculous. You gotta get a second mortgage on your house just to pay the bill. But you're so overwhelmed as, as to how well they execute on, yeah. on their mission and on their, on their distinguishing characteristics that you easily rationalize this small fortune that you just paid. I see this in the advisor business quite a bit. They're, there's They do a lot to distinguish themselves. A lot of firms do a lot to distinguish themselves from the typical thing that you hear from advisors. Oh, I provide great service or I have great technology. Those aren't distinguishing characteristics. Anybody can say that. It's the experience and how well you execute against that experience in your office that leaves the lasting impression where your clients walk out and they can't wait to refer their friends into you. And that's the, that. then you get to that reputation thing Maisie was talking about in that you're building this reputation after you've established that good foundation, that brand foundation. And so I'll explain. Uh, first of all, you got me hungry. So let's just start there. Second part is, I think we all just ran through their favorite restaurant and why we love it so much. And you cause us to think differently. Uh, it is the experience. And so, you know, Maisie, so he, here I am, you've, you've gotten me all excited. I have a really good firm. I have really great people around me. I feel like I'm authentic. I deliver a great service to my clientele and I want to do more. So I, I'm, I'm in, you've hooked me. What do I do next? Sure. And also, Derek, uh, I'd love to know the name of that restaurant if I'm ever in Saudi Arabia. That's the power of the referral, right? And of the good reputation. Um, right. Sure, absolutely. So um, you're ready to go for with your business. You're, you're, you've got a great service. What I'd really want to know now is what in particular from your kind of set of personal attribute, attributes and your um, your business focus sets you apart. So what is your focus? Are you a family focused business? Are you, do you want to project an image of exclusivity maybe? Or do you do something different in the way that you execute your work? Do you have different innovative strategies or, or a different set of products? Like what is it from what you do? You obviously do it excellently, but I would want to know what it is. And from there, you can build a set of assets and, and then roll out a strategy. And I guess at this point, it might be helpful for me just to talk through some of the key places and ways in which you can you can start to build. Yeah, so it would be helpful. So in a more kind of um, strategic way. And one thing I'll mention here, and I know Derek may well talk to this as well, is that, of course, 
um, working in the field that you do, you need to be mindful. I'm sure you are very mindful of the regulatory and compliance obligations that you have when it comes to marketing. So when you start to actually build out some new materials or some output for your firm, um, it is absolutely critical that you seek expert counsel, whether that's within your firm or, or elsewhere, on making sure that these things are compliant so that um, so that you achieve the business success that you're, you're seeking. Um, so the first thing I would talk about is a website. Of course, everybody has a website. Um, but everyone also knows that websites vary widely in their quality. So make sure that your website is good. That does not mean it has to be complicated. It doesn't have to be stuffed full of content, but it needs to be well executed. So a kind of a clean, simple look. Um, less is more, in, in my opinion, on websites. Um, it's got to showcase that brand that you've developed, that language that really reflects you, your services and what you do. So direct language, uh, imagery that's professional and, and, and looks modern um, and make sure that there's nothing wrong on your website. There aren't errors and that it's kept up to date and that it's got fresh and interesting content on it. Um, there's nothing kind of more off putting, I think, if you're looking at a new firm's website to see either a small error, it can just erode trust that you've built up in an instant or, or, or old things that are no longer relevant. Um, so those are kind of my comments on the website, which is a core kind of tenet of your, of your marketing offer. Um, I'd also talk a little about LinkedIn. So LinkedIn can be a really powerful tool for marketing. That said, it is, it's a professional networking site. It's not a place uh, for aggressive marketing, but it can be really, really helpful for raising that brand awareness. So once you've got that brand down, you feel confident in how you talk about yourself and your business. It's a great place to kind of um, to amplify that voice and also to build relationships and networks with potential clients clients and other people that could be really useful for the growth of your business. Um, one really good tactic for LinkedIn, I think, is kind of using it as an individual to chip in on kind of interesting industry debates that are out there, posting your thoughts, your thought leadership that position you as an interesting business leader in your field. Um, and then just a couple of other things that I think can be really helpful. A lot of firms put out a regular newsletter, for example, to past, current, and potential future clients into their wider network. Um, that can be quite a, a cost-effective, but, but, um, but high reward thing to do, in fact. Um, if you're going to do something like that, I would say try and keep it really snappy. Uh, don't put it out too regularly. Keep it snappy and keep the content interesting and a little bit different if you can. Um, so that people actually read it. And, and, you know, I certainly receive a few newsletters that I actually look forward to reading because I always know you know, they're a good read and there's something interesting in there. <clears throat> I'd also talk to oh, client events is another thing I just wanted to mention, you know, in your field in particular, I think they're a really, really important way of marketing yourself. So make sure to, to host those client events, um, invite not only your current clients, but ask mm -hmm. them to invite their wider network. It's just an excellent way in a kind of um, relaxed environment to build that network, project your brand and, and hopefully, you know, grow your business. And, um, I'm curious. First of all, those are all excellent tips. Uh, second one is uh, Worth Media happens to be um, a little bit in this area. Uh, we help um, through our leading advisor program, uh, folks amplify um, what they do and how they do it. We also have um, many live events where we take thought leaders and subject matter experts around various topics. So the idea of putting good work out there and, and putting folks in front of others uh, showing their good work and what their unique perspective is, um, is something we spend a lot of time on, especially through our leading advisor program. Um, but what's interesting, and I'm curious, Derek, is um, can you go too far, right? I mean, if we have a bunch of people being too aggressive or sharing a bunch of stuff, I know we talked uh, earlier about some folks that spent a lot of time getting this brand out there, almost ahead of the charge of, wait a second, what do they do? I've seen other firms that are closely held secret and there's some sort of scarcity value to the idea of like, look, we don't really want to spend time on marketing. We have referrals and that seems to be enough. And so, you know, we, we have all kinds of experiences here. I'm curious from your side um, where you look at what is a valuable firm, what is a valuable practice um, is one better than the other and, and any perspectives and thoughts on that. I've seen, you know, a lot of, Maisie was talking about websites and um, I've seen a lot of great websites in my career with financial advisors. I've seen a lot of poor ones too, but, um, but I've seen a lot of great ones. And, and 
as I've gotten to know these advisors over the years, I, I see a lot of them fall into this trap, though. And that's this trap of words, but no action or execution. You can't have a website that talks about how your firm and the professionals within it truly spend the time to learn about your financial situation. But when the clients get there, you don't listen to them. Or you, even worse, you interrupt them when when you're when they're trying to explain what their financial situation is. You can't promise a relationship that's going to be based on constant and candid conversation, but then not answer the phone calls from your clients in a timely yeah. manner. Which, by the way, is one of the number one reasons clients fire their advisors is because of a lack of communication or a lack of timely communication. So execution in our business is paramount. You have to execute. You can put all these things in LinkedIn. You can say all these things on your website. But if you're not backing up your words, then you don't have, you have a, you have a inconsistency with what you're saying versus what you're doing. And that, <clears throat> that adds to a poor relationship. So I would, I would, urge, and I do urge advisors to spend as much time on making sure they can actually execute what they put in their website. Yes, everyone wants the sizzle element and they want all those things. But if you are not doing financial planning for your clients, don't say that. You don't want to say that for from a reputational standpoint. You certainly don't want to say it from a compliance standpoint. So, um, you know, I think it's it, it's very important to back up what you're saying. In terms of um, you know you, the content, putting content out there on LinkedIn and and being an influencer in your industry and all that, um, I have mixed feelings on it. To be honest, I, I I think it's one of those things where you have to you got to be in the game, you got to be there doing it, or else you you the absence of of that content, the absence of your personality coming through social media will be noted in some respects. But at the same time, I struggle a little bit in translating that into a into what it totally does for your brand, and even more so what that means in terms of revenue growth and profitability growth for your business. So sometimes that uh, there's a clear connection, especially those that really use their brand to get people to events, which in those and they uh, and they choose to go with you or not at those events, and those become clients, which translate into revenue. There's a direct line there, and it's very clear. In other cases, I kind of struggle with it a bit. Yeah, which gets back to the point on authenticity, right? So uh, lack of execution, follow through, and um, you got to walk the talk. And if it shows up everywhere, it's great. If it doesn't, it shows up eventually as being something less than perfect. And, and maybe let's turn the conversation there. So let's talk about less than perfect. So we have this brand, things are going well, all the activities are good, um, but change and and sometimes uh, not great things happen. And so uh, let's just let's just dig into that a little bit more. Maisie, so, you know, whether let's say, you know, somebody, a key talent of the firm leaves um, and that might be unexpected or that might, you know, involve some point of concern from both existing clients and then how it then affects the brand. How do you manage situations like that and where and how can brand be uh, helpful here in thinking through that? Sure, yeah, and, and that scenario that you just outlined there, you know, can happen to any type of business in, in any industry and, and it's always um, potentially quite challenging. Um, one thing I would say is that you can absolutely plan for that scenario and you should plan for it. If you run or work in a client facing business, there's really no excuse for not planning for that event. And it's in the planning that you will have um, a better outcome for sure. Um, so there's no sort of perfect solution or, or, or sort of um, perfect way to handle it, but there are certainly some core plan planning elements and, and execution that you can do that will really help. So the first thing to say is that um, it's not a good idea to have a client that only has one point of contact into your firm. You want all of your clients to have multiple touch points into your firm so that in the event that a key talent leaves, that they were not their only point of contact into the firm. So that's a first kind of point of planning. 
The second is that when um, someone leaves, I think it's really important to show a positive face. You know, people will judge you on the way that you behave in that at the, that exact moment. So if possible, sort of almost celebrate the fact that the person's made a great contribution to your firm and, and that they're moving on and, 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 and frame it if you can in some kind of a positive light. And that will reflect better in the longer term on your firm. Um, the other thing to say is that if you have established a really strong brand for your firm, that will really benefit you at the point where, where a, a key member of client facing um, staff goes, because you can then demonstrate that your firm has value in itself that's greater than the individual RIA that has decided to move on elsewhere. So um, in terms of practical steps, um, when something like that actually happens, to minimize harm and hopefully keep hold of as many clients as you possibly can. If you can, giving advance notice of the departure to that person's clients is, is preferable if it's possible. Let them know when the change is happening, um, who their new points of contact is, and, and to provide reassurance, um, project the value of the wider firm, and, and, and kind of um, provide them with an open door if they've got any concerns. So, so that's, that's the first thing that we would advise um, in that scenario. If you can't do it in advance, then at least attempt to be the person still that breaks the news to the clients yourself it's much better that it comes first from your firm or from you than that that news comes from somewhere else uh, worst of all from a rumor for example um so you want to get in there early with the news so that you can control that message and you can you can put put your best foot forward um so and, and yeah in any communications around it just emphasize repeatedly the value proposition of your firm make sure that those clients feel valued that they feel safe and, and that they're in steady hands with you and with the wider firm and be as kind of clear and open as possible in all your communications. And, um, and that should help in a scenario like that, that I know can feel a bit daunting. So planning and then executing those steps um, sh should minimize the kind of disruption to your business. Wonderful. And, and presumably all that communication should be applied internal comms as much as it is external comms. And I would think um, it also sort of brings about another question for you, Derek. Um, you know, these types of situations or and or situations where companies are now in play, whether, you know, so now you're in a transaction. How do you best communicate internally and externally during a time of transition? Um, if you are the seller and uh, you're spending your time now focusing on um, you know, what the future is now going to be. It's an M&A transaction. You have a team that wants to know what's happening. Do you even tell clients? Give, give us your perspective on how it's well handled during a, a, an M&A transaction. Well, you know, at Godstone, we, we counsel our clients on, um, I think this was best, best said with Jim Collins and Good to Great, where you, you want to be that clock building organization where you're building a, a firm that is not around any particular central leader, but it's around a foundation that everyone buys into and, and believes in. And when that, you know, maybe charismatic leader decides to leave, retire, what have you, that you don't see this roller coaster effect in your business where you're losing clients and having to bring them back. That your clients see, okay, well, Bob's gone or, or Sally's gone, but at the same time, the rest of the firm is upholding this experience. They, 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 you know, they embody that brand that was built perhaps by Bob or Sally, but they're still there and there's no reason for us to leave. And a lot of buyers in our industry look for that. Did, did somebody build a clock over time where it can withstand any one or two people leaving the firm? without seeing a lot of attrition and breakage, which is, you know, the the devil in, in a lot of these these deals out there. Um, so I, you know, I think as you as you look to then communicate when there is a transition, I always counsel clients to not not to go to their clients, the underlying investor, let's just say in our case, and just introduce a change. Nobody likes change. And sometimes there's a lot of negative connotations that go with change. You're not introducing a change. You're introducing a, a new world that's better than the one that they're in today. And why is that? Well, we're bringing in more talent. 
We're bringing in the capabilities, these five capabilities that we frankly couldn't build on our own. We've got a deeper bench than you've ever seen before. So if you thought we answered phone calls quickly uh, yesterday, wait till tomorrow with our new partner and what they can bring to the table. The technology that we're getting through our new partnership is much better than what you had before. You get all of these things and you get us. You continue to work with the people you've worked with in the past, that you've established trust with in the past. That, if I'm a client listening to that pitch versus, hey, Derek, I got to tell you about a change. We're going to have to move your accounts. There's going to be paperwork, signatures. Yeah, I know it's a pain, but we'll get it done. You know, what message sounds better there? And so we we counsel our, our clients to make sure they're they're proposing, they're coaching their clients through a very positive change for the future versus a, you know, kind of this necessary change. Of and, and the pain will have to get through. It's so true. And now that it, it, it all sounds like common sense, but but yes, when you give both examples, I, I my brain goes to I've seen it done very badly. I've I've gotten those phone calls. You know, I need to change your paperwork. All the way to the other side, which is let me tell you what's happening and and uh, why you'll be made better for it, um, and how, why your relationship will get stronger with us. So, um, super helpful, um, Maisie. I'm curious. Uh, this is, you know, let's say we're we're listening and participating in this in this discussion, and and now we're excited. We've we've thought about branding in a way maybe we haven't. Marketing is starting to, you know, key in is coming front in front of mind. What what's the reality in in the industry? Do people spend enough time, especially those that are charged with this with this responsibility, um, thinking about this stuff? In your perspective, it should be is there always more to be done here? Like, what, take us through how much of a priority this is in the industry and, and for a particular person growing a firm? Absolutely. Um, it totally depends, honestly, on you, on your business and on your business goals. So if you are looking to grow your business rapidly, then thinking about these things and executing a strategy has got to be a core part of your day-to-day work but what I would kind of emphasize with this type of work is rather than doing a huge amount of work on it or outlaying a huge amount of resources on it in a short period of time and then and then thinking okay job done now I can move on with my job generally that is not the best approach a sort of a steady cadence getting used to this being part of the core of your day-to-day work and and sort of getting in the habit of thinking about it um, on a regular basis is a much, much uh, better approach, I would say. There are times, of course, when you may need to focus more on it. You know, you've decided you need a new website, for example, or you, or you decide you want to rebrand. Um, and then there, there are a whole suite of options available, um, depending on your resources available as to how to do that. But I would certainly say that attending to it on a regular basis and getting into that mindset, always of thinking, making sure that you present yourself um, whenever you're speaking to clients um, in a consistent way with your brand and the reputation that you want to have in the industry. So it should kind of always be in your mind, but that doesn't mean that you have to be consistently putting a huge amount of material or new material out out there. It's more about that steady consistency. And and like I said, in particular with your reputation, that's not something you can change overnight. It's a a long-term project and something you need to think about strategically and, and consistently seek out opportunities to project um, the brand that you want to be out there in the world um, on a, in a consistent way, I would say. So it's certainly something everyone should be thinking about and, and putting particular emphasis on if you're looking to grow. That's terrific. And and um, Derek, I imagine you're across folks that, you know, I, I think of uh, Jack of all trades, master of none, right? These folks are the CRO, they're the CHRO, they're... The CMO. I mean, you're dealing with business owners, principals that wear multiple hats. In your view, are they not spending enough time on this on this topic? On this as a priority? I'm, I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I can understand a lot of these small business owners. They do have to wear all those hats. And um, in our business, like many industries, I would imagine the complexity in each of those areas, whether it's HR, compliance, legal, technology, certainly. Um, is just growing and growing. And the frustration levels people have, especially in the areas where they're, they don't consider themselves an expert. You know, we have a lot of advisors that are very good at growing their business and are good in sales, perhaps in marketing, 
but are not great in technology. And they may not have the resources to be able to hire the CIO to come in and do it. Um, but certainly, you know, you used to hear this phrase all the time. I guess you still do that. If you're not growing, you're dying. And I, I used to think it was just kind of a throwaway thing that, um, uh, that you're not, you know, you can be, you have a perfectly, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> successful business and not grow. But in, in, and now what's happening in, in the wealth management industry, I think it is true. If you're not growing, you are dying because there are firms out there that have such powerful marketing machines and such powerful sales machines that even if you didn't grow and you, all you did was focus on your existing clients, well, those people are focusing on your clients now. And you, know, you drive down I-5 I here in San Diego, and there's multiple billboards of advisors, financial advisory firms that you didn't see in the past. Some of them have radio shows, some of them don't. But your clients are seeing those billboards. And if you happen to have a poor quarter, or if you happen to have not heard from your advisor this quarter, whatever it is, that they're because those impressions weren't there before. Those websites weren't as strong before. Now there's money and time and people being put into these mar outbound marketing campaigns and your clients are at risk. So yeah, if you're not growing, you are dying um, because you have to, whatever you lose, you gotta, you gotta make up if you wanna stay even in terms of revenue. I mean, fascinating and so insightful because it really is the transition about um, thinking about marketing in this question as an expense versus an investment. And others, especially the bigger ones are constantly making that investment. Um, but your point that, the fact that you are at risk, um, some people may put A, their head in the sand, or B, not be willing, at least mindset-wise, to think about this as an investment. And so um, maybe over to you, Maisie, on that. You know, I, I love everything you've said. I, I, I want to learn more about Penta, and I want to take advantage of your services. Tell, tell me, when when is that too soon? When When do I arrive at the point where I can take advantage of this? What's been your experience from you know a smaller size firm all the way up to the bigger firms and and when and how they look at this stuff. As I said before, I think this is something that that everyone should be thinking about. Um, and certainly, we work with firms of all sizes, from absolutely tiny to enormous corporates. Um, and at all at all points in their in their growth tra trajectory, I don't think there's a wrong time to start thinking about this. You may have a very established and successful brand. Your reputation may be strong, but you still want to um, progress further. You want to tweak something. You want to change your approach. Um, you want to build your profile in a different area, or you might have a 10 year career goal of of, of something um, and, and you need to be able to orientate yourself towards it. And you seek advice um, for that reason. But we also um, take firms that don't have a brand at all. They may not even have a name. And we work through the process from the absolute ground up, which is a super exciting thing to be involved with, I have to say, and, and something that has to be done really in close collaboration with with a, with communications professionals and the business leaders. And that's a really exciting um, kind of other end of the spectrum uh, piece of work. So we certainly work with people at all stages, um, as I said, across a wide range of industries, but we have really strong financial expertise. So if anyone out there is interested in talking more about it, do get in touch with me, happy to talk about um, what, what we have to offer. But certainly there's no right or wrong time to seek um, advice on this um, and and to, to spend some time really thinking through how um, these, these approaches could help your business to grow and thrive. That's that's amazing. Uh, you now have a friend in the business if you, if you hadn't before. So I encourage everybody to, to focus on that. Uh, Derek, over to you. I'd love to use the time that we have left with only a few minutes. Just uh, tell us, I know you have an exciting conference coming up and, and what's happening there. Yeah, our next month, May 2nd and 3rd in Atlantic City, New Jersey, we have our annual M&A conference for Gladstone Group. And uh, excited to have well over 100 financial advisors and RIAs in the business, some attending uh, in the hopes of learning more about buying businesses, <clears throat> others looking to determine whether they want to sell their business, whether it's the right time to sell their business, whether anybody in the audience is interested in buying their business. Uh, but it's it's ultimately bringing these people together and they're going to get they're going to hear a lot from a lot of experts on on what you know what is the right time uh, if you're looking at doing this? Are you a good candidate? If you don't really feel like 
um, selling your business. However, you want to up your game. You, you realize that if you're not growing, you're dying. If you realize all that and want to do something about it, you're going to hear from a lot of experts that can help you improve your firm in a number of ways where instead of selling your business because you may feel that's the only way to achieve those things, you can actually find ways to up your game and, and be part of that, that, that group that is out there perhaps buying businesses. So it, it really depends. I mean, we are an investment banker. We're, we're a consultant. We're not just there to try to get you to sell your business. That's not what it's about. We're, we're here to give you the environment to make informed decisions, to hear from some great experts, to have fun, because we still all want to have fun. And in Atlantic City, I mean, come on, that's the definition of fun, right? And uh, and so hopefully you can you can make it out to, to the conference. That's terrific. And and uh and and you'll have the chance to see everybody in person um May 2nd and 3rd. Uh and we're gonna try to take this discussion on the road and, and see everybody uh in person. So we look forward to that. Um and then lastly, just on worth, um, to share a bit more is um, our, our advisor program. For those that are, are participating and listening, we, we encourage you to take a look at that. There's a set of tools and uh, various ways that we at Worth try to convene this community, focus on topics like these, and then offer a suite of activities that um, might be able to help get you started in that toolkit that we were talking about earlier. But uh, it's been a great chat. Time has flown. I really want to thank you, Derek and Maisie, for your insights. I think... Um, it's it's a conversation that you know sometimes you have to pull some folks to the table, but when you do, uh, we unlock a lot of uh, thinking, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of follow up here. So I encourage everybody to reach out directly and or join us on May second and third. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for listening, watching, and we'll see you all hopefully soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.